The scripture reading this evening is from Genesis chapter 26, verse 17 and 18. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given. at the text that was read just a few moments ago. It's from Genesis chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, and if you want to take a moment to flip over to that opening, we'll examine it just a little bit. I don't know about when you go in houses, other people's houses, and what you notice in those houses. I've been in houses before that had uh, the theme, it seemed like, was of a lighthouse. They would have displays of lighthouses all through the house, a painting on the wall of a lighthouse. Very beautiful, and uh, certainly something that uh, we can even draw lessons from as far as what that lighthouse stands for. Been in houses where there were porcelain dolls all over the place, and uh, that person loved dolls, and they bought them and displayed them in various uh, areas throughout the house and paintings sometimes of uh, cowboys or horses, animals of various kinds. But I've been in a few houses that had wells, W-E-L-L-S, displayed in paintings on the wall and uh, different things. And that's kind of what I want to look at tonight because I love to see those old-time wells like what's displayed on the PowerPoint up here. I love to see those old hand pump wells. I'm not sure exactly what you call them, but uh, we had one in our front yard at one time, and it brings back good memories to think about that. In Henderson, Tennessee, when I was living there, I went by a house one time that was in a movie. The movie was Walking Tall, and it wasn't um, the one with The Rock in it. It was the one from 1973, the original Walking Tall. And um, I knew that house was in that town, but I didn't know exactly where it was, about six miles out of the town. But a lady who worked at the bank was telling me she owned the property. No one lived in it anymore. She said, you could go by and take a look. And so I went by and saw the sawmill that sat over to the right of the house and saw the house, recognized it immediately. And also in the backyard, there was a well. And it was in the movie, too, so I had to go back to see that also. I don't know if it was because I went and looked at the property, but immediately thereafter, a fence went up around the property to keep people from going in and seeing all of that. But uh, it was kind of a a neat experience to see that well. Someone had to take the time to do that, to build those wells, and it wasn't probably something that was all that easy to do. You know, it's a modern convenience for us to walk over to our sink and just hit the handle and water comes out. But now, just go back just a little bit in time, even maybe to a great-grandparent or maybe even a grandparent like me, like my grandparent had to do is what I should say, and they would uh, go out and draw water from a well sometimes before the city ran water to their house. And so, in thinking about these different wells that they had, this one here probably didn't look anything like what the one on the screen shows. But it probably was a shaft that went down into the earth, and it probably had rocks that came up alongside of it. It may have even had some type of a cap on top of it. It may have been at ground level, or it could have been up just a little bit. But they put that cap there for a reason, to keep debris from falling down into the well and to keep animals, quite frankly, from falling down into the well. But that well to them was really a modern convenience. They had that usually centralized in the town to where people could come to it to draw the water. And it was a lot more convenient than going down to the brook to get water having that well dug in town. 
And in this story, Abraham actually oversaw the digging of the original well. The Bible says in verse 17, And Isaac departed from there, and he camped in the valley of Gerah. Now we know that name, Gerah. That's where the king lived, of which Abraham, when he went into Gerah, said, Sarah, you say that you're my sister. And Isaac turned around when he went into Gerah and did the exact same thing. The Bible says Isaac settled there. So he settled in the valley of Gerah. Then Isaac dug again the well of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same name as his father had given them. So tonight we're going to be considering these two verses just briefly, looking at them as different stories unfold from these two verses. But really, I guess the main story to consider in this is the labor of love that Isaac had for his father, Abraham, who not only redug the well, but he gave him the exact same name that Abraham had given them in the long ago. So there's three patriarchs that we need to consider tonight also, as far as the Hebrew people are concerned concerned. Abraham, who was held in extremely high position among the Hebrew people, even in the days of Jesus, and beyond that. Abraham's son Isaac, who's also held in high esteem, and then Jacob, whose name eventually is going to be changed to Israel. Because it's within these three individuals, and within their lifespan, that you really see the birth of the Hebrew people as a nation of people. And that's the one reason why in Jesus' time, even in that time, people would refer to Abraham, not just as Abraham, but as Father Abraham. So it's important to remember that Abraham pretty much was a nomad in his day. He really didn't have a place where he settled and stayed in that place. We remember the great journey of faith that took him from Ur all the way eventually to Hebron, where he settled for a while. But it wasn't uncommon for Abraham to uproot his family, his servants, his cattle, his sheep, and to make a journey within what we call modern-day Israel today and to settle at a different area. Out of necessity, whenever they would settle in that place, they would have to be near a water source generally a spring or a brook, and they would settle in that area. But if it was not that option, then they had to rely on manual labor in order to produce water. So in several places you'll find in the Bible, when they came to a certain area, they dug a well. And this is one of those places where they did that. There are several different types of well. There's, like we said, the kind that you can crank the handle on. There is the kind you lower uh, the bucket down into. This one probably was something similar to that. Not easy to retrieve water from there, but certainly better than any other option that they had back at that time. Now, people are kind of funny. They're kind of strange, and the Philistines were such a group of people because they had this water that was left for them after Abraham left the area and after he passed on, they certainly could have for centuries pulled water out of that well. But instead of doing that, they threw stones down into it to stop it up. We're not exactly told why they did that. But I think you can imagine why they probably did that. The Philistine people for centuries would be a thorn in the flesh to the Hebrew people. But the fact of the matter is they were probably there before the Hebrew people. And so they probably weren't real happy with this group of people who kept expanding in that area. And so the Philistines, as soon as they could, just like when a country invades another country, as soon as they take control of that country, a lot of times what they do is they go and pull down the statues 
and pull down the monuments that were dedicated to the people that they had just conquered. And so uh, that's probably what's going on here in this story also. So it would be worth our while just for a second to look a little bit closer at the Philistine people. Like I said, they were a thorn in the flesh to the Hebrew people all throughout the Old Testament times. It's believed that a few hundred years before this story unfolds in the Bible of Abraham digging that well, that these people may have actually come from the Aegean Sea region, up by Greece, Turkey's over to the other side, and right in the middle is a bunch of little islands. These people originally, it's thought, were called people of the sea. Now, that's going to change dramatically over the next few hundred years, but at one time, it's believed that that was the people. And they were very good at designing merchant boats. They were very good at designing war ships or boats and, uh, and also for recreation and other things. So these people of the sea, it's thought, they are the group of people that left that region of the Aegean Sea and completely 100% surprised the Egyptians. They came down and they made headway into conquering them. So here you had the number one power in the world at that time being attacked by this group of people, and they were fairly successful at it until the Egyptians finally, finally rallied and then shoved them back to their ships and they left. Some of them, it's believed, went into Palestine. And being in Palestine now, they started to settle the coastal towns. And little by little, by the time Abraham comes along, they have made inroads into that country. And no longer are they the people of the sea, but now they're farmers and merchants, producers of crops and goods to be sent other places, traders, if you will. And they are still warriors and quite effective at it. But they're no longer that group of people that had successfully attacked Egypt by surprising them through the sea. Now Isaac enters the scene after all of that. And he follows in the footsteps of his father's father. And you can imagine as he's following in those footsteps, he comes across various things periodically and he recognizes it maybe through his own vision because he might have been a child that went with his father to these places or through the stories that are told he knows this is the place where at one time his father had stayed for a time and he maybe built altars or wells. So Isaac enters the scene and he passes this well and you can almost imagine the thought that crosses his mind as he passes it because he now sees a non-functioning structure that should have been functioning. The people should have been benefiting from the use of that well, but they were not able to because the rocks had been thrown into it and it was stopped. So as a labor of love, Isaac is going to take the time to pull out with his servants, to pull out these rocks to see if they can't get the water to flow once again. And he's successful at that. And Abraham really should be owed a great debt of gratitude for his initial vision of digging that well in that spot. But not just Abraham, but also Isaac should be owed a great debt of gratitude for him taking the time to restore that well back to its original glory and function. So for the remainder of the time tonight, I want us to look just a little bit closer using that Old Testament illustration of that well and how it was stopped up. I want us to look a little bit closer at that story and make a comparative study with the church today. We're going to consider some things because for decades now, literally decades, I have heard people say, it's not give me the man but not the plan. That's what they'll say. Give me the man, but not the plan. And what they're saying when they say that is, give me Jesus Christ, but I don't want his plan, the plan for the church. I don't want his word. They think it's outdated. They don't think it's necessary anymore. 
And for 40 years now, I've tried my best to convey to people, you cannot have one of those things, the man, without the plan that he's given. Those two things go together. They cannot be separated. It's hard sometimes to get people to understand that. When Christ established the church in 33 AD or around that time, he established it with certain guidelines. He established it with a certain plan that we are to follow. I'm very thankful, for example, for the plan of salvation. That very first step in that hearing carries an enormous burden for me as a believer in Jesus Christ, one who has heard the word and it convicts and then motivated, and I've been doing what I've been doing for 40 years now because of that. Hearing, that lies on my shoulders. Just like the Ethiopian, when he traveled into Gaza, and Nathan's been studying this on Sunday morning, when he traveled into Gaza and the Spirit called Philip over to him, the very first thing that's said is, do you understand what you're reading? And his response to that should motivate us. How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me? Now, once it's explained to that person, that plan of salvation continues. Because upon hearing the word of God, that's going to put the, the one that's doing the hearing in a certain situation to where he's going to have to make a decision. Am I going to follow what's just been taught to me? I can accept it. Am I going to reject it? That's totally up to that person to accept or to reject. If he accepts it, he's saying that he believes it. And in believing it, how can you continue walking down the wrong way? That should motivate him or her to want to respond in a way of repentance. To say, I no longer can live this life. I now understand what was just taught to me. I'm going to have to change my life and correct some things in it in order to be pleasing to God. And why would that stop anyone? It should motivate all of us to want to scream his name from the mountaintops, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon doing that, what stops me from entering the watery grave of baptism? Not to cleanse my flesh, as the Bible says, but to cleanse my conscience, to get me to where I need to be in that proper relationship with Christ. Rising up out of this water, leaving the old man behind, and moving forward now to live a faithful life in Jesus Christ. Yes, I'll stumble along the way, but I can pick myself up with his aid. I can pray and ask forgiveness, and I believe he hears my prayers if it's sincere, and I believe that he forgives me of my sins. I'm so glad that we had the plan of salvation in the Bible. I'm equally proud that we have in the Bible how God wishes for us to worship him. That plan also. A plan of worship, of singing and praying, searching the scriptures, partaking of the Lord's Supper, laying by in store on the first day of the week. A plan of sharing and studying with others along the way so that not only will we make it to that beautiful city of light one day, but also others will make it there as well. I'm so thankful for that road map that we find in the Bible that gets us from point A to point B. That map, the Bible, isn't really all that difficult to follow. Now, I know there's some places in the Bible that are extremely difficult for us to understand. Nathan's going to have a study on the book of Revelation, and that's one of those books that we sometimes have trouble studying. Ezekiel in the Old Testament is another book that we sometimes have trouble studying. But the Bible's fairly simplistic written, and that's written that way for our benefit along the way. For example, he didn't say, sing and learn how to play an instrument in order to worship me. He simply said, sing with the right attitude in order to worship me. He didn't say, seek out a priest 
and have that person pray for you, but instead he said, you lift your voice up to God and you do it following the will of God and he'll hear you. He didn't man mandate how much we should give each week. He said, give until you smile, basically. So all these things, and by the way, he didn't confuse us by giving us a thousand churches to pick from. He gave us one church. And it's from that one church that we can draw eternal water along the way. That fountain of eternal water that we can drink from, that we have had the ability to drink from for all this time. We've taken that pure body of water and unfortunately we put other things in it. And in essence, sometimes we've tried to stop it up. Now we need to remember not even the gates of hell will prevail against us, against the church. But we sometimes have tried to stop it up. The very simplistic plan with the man, Jesus Christ, is for us to follow. I don't know why, but sometimes we do come along and we have difficulty in following that. So I want to be very careful here. I don't want for you to go away tonight saying, well, Doug was pretty hard on the church tonight because that's not what I'm trying to be. I am concerned that some in the brotherhood seemingly think that the distinctiveness distinctiveness of the church isn't necessary anymore. Or maybe the uniqueness of the church isn't something that necessarily needs to be followed. Well, I think it does matter. Because it is unique because of the way in which it was established. It was established according to Christ and his will. It wasn't established according to the pagan religions of the world today. It wasn't established to pay lip service to Christ, and we could do basically anything we want to. It wasn't established to tickle the ears of man along the way. It was established through the blood of Jesus Christ as his plan for mankind to get us from this earth to heaven. And woe unto anyone who attempts to change, listen, the divine pattern that we are to follow. So where I want to go with the rest of the lesson tonight, I'm not really going to talk about uh, deciding if uh, the instrument should be brought in in our singing. I've done that in the past. You've heard lessons I've presented on that, but that's not what I'm going to do tonight. Or how we have to uh, try to confuse the masses of people by allowing others to take the spiritual leadership role that was designed for men. I've done that in the past, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm not going to talk to you tonight about our giving and how some seem to be all right with giving less instead of giving more of their life through time, energy, and effort, and also financially. There's several different directions that I could go. One of the most unthinkable things to me is how some in the brotherhood have attempted in recent decades to try to involve God and evolution hand in hand in the creation of the world. And I've talked to you in times past about that, but I'm not going to talk to you about that tonight. Tonight, it's much easier to understand. There's no complicated thoughts that I have to tell you tonight that require advanced degrees in order to understand. The message is very simplistic. It was said this morning by Steve Vesey up here. God is spirit. And they, all of us, God is spirit. And all of us that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth want to be pleasing to God in how you worship him you're going to have to throw off the shackles that bind you and the whims that come along the way and you're going to have to simply listen and obey God the truth of his word
day by day, studying it, coming to a fuller understanding of it, and implementing it in your life as you worship him. The spirit part there is interesting. Because when it says worship him in spirit and truth, some want to try to tie in the Holy Spirit to that opening. Well, that's not really the case in this case. Now, indirectly, I think you can make the argument there. But directly what it's talking about is you in a personal way. Not only do you have to know the truth of God's word, but in a very personal way, you have to have the right attitude whenever you worship God. You know, it's totally possible for you to be here every Sunday morning for Bible class, for worship, Sunday night for worship, Wednesday night. And listen to the truth being given to you. And maybe even believing the truth. But if you're not worshiping him with the right attitude, it's not exactly what he's asking you to do. And you might come in here every time and have the right attitude, but be in error of how to worship him. You see, there's two things here being connected. It is worship God with the right attitude and with the truth of his word. That's certainly something that we can do and should be doing. Sometimes when we offer a prayer, we'll say something along the way of, God, please accept our worship as we have offered it to you in spirit and truth. Or accept it as a sweet aroma to you. And in saying that, what we're saying is we hope what we've done is pleasing to you. We need to get it right. And if we're not doing it right and we figure that out, we certainly need to make changes along the way. All of that, spirit and truth, comes from John 4, 24. It's the story of a person who was not worshiping God in the right way. She had to go through a great transformation in her life. And perhaps it's a transformation that you and I are going through or need to be going through in our life. I don't know why. We we speculate. I don't know why when the woman came upon the well, she was by herself. I know that the thought is she wasn't living a good life. The other women shunned her, and so she had to go at a separate time when they weren't there. Now, it may be, but we're not told that. Another thought is, she chose not to be with those other women. And so she went to the well when she knew they wouldn't be there. But whatever the reason is, she was by herself, which changes the whole dynamic of what's about to happen. Because, ladies, if you came upon a situation where you had to walk to a certain spot, and it was outside of the town, what would go through your mind if you saw a man standing where you had to be? Today, I think there would be some concern. If you didn't know who this person was, and you had to go to that very spot where that person was standing. Can you imagine the apprehension that might have gone through her mind? Should I just stay here, or should I continue? She decided to continue doesn't take her long after she's gone a few more feet to come to the understanding as she talks to this man. He's just not a man, he's a Hebrew. The Samaritans were despised by the Hebrew people. Now we always stop it there and we need to take that a step further. The Samaritans didn't like the Hebrews either, okay? So these are two groups of people that didn't get along. And yet this man's going to make a request of her Will you give me some water to drink? He doesn't even have a vessel to pull the water. And yet he's asking her for that. And literally what it means is, I'm willing to put my lips on the very cup that you drink from in order for me to get a drink. Jesus was beginning to change this woman's life because she just saw a man. And now she sees a Hebrew man. But with just a short time of that, She's going to come to call him rabbi. And she does it with great joy in her life now to say, rabbi, teacher. She wants to know more about what he's talking about. 
as he continues to tell her things. Nobody else could know according to the scriptures except for a prophet. She realizes it. And she actually says that very thing. You're telling me things that nobody would know unless they were a prophet. She's recognized him now as a prophet. First a man, then a Hebrew man, then a teacher, now a prophet. But he's not finished in teaching her. He continues to teach her. And little by little, you see the greatest transformation take place in this woman's life. A woman who was living a sin-filled life now is given a golden opportunity to drink from a well. She didn't dig that well. She's about to get spiritual water that's going to last into eternity when she says, you're the one we've been waiting for. Wow. She leaves the vessel of water there the very reason, that life-sustaining water they have to have, it's gone from her mind at that time. She leaves that vessel there and runs back into town. And it's this woman who's living this lifestyle who brings the town out to Jesus. And as Steve said today, a couple of days went by, and many people believed. She could have kept that contained within herself. She certainly had reasons to as far as how they were treating her. But she looked beyond that to also include other people who might have a chance now to receive this life-altering water that takes a sin-filled life and transforms it to a sinless life. As we close out today, I want to notice what she didn't do. She didn't say to Jesus, I don't like the message that you're giving me. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to change the message to fit my lifestyle. What she did was took her sin-ridden lifestyle and she began to change it to fit what Christ was saying. The very thing that we have to do today also. There's a lot of lessons we can learn from a well. One of them is, as I was taught by my dad, that well that we had on our property, we didn't need it. But every now and then my dad, who loved farm life, um, would go down to that and prime it. He would take some water with him. And I remember at a very young age, he and I walking down to that well. He explained it to me. My, one of my grandfathers explained it to me later, and I could remember both those times that it was explained to me why in the world you would take good water and pour down that well. But the return is going to be astronomical compared to that little bit that you give right now. So with those thoughts in mind, there could be one in the audience tonight Maybe you have inadvertently been throwing some rocks into the well and maybe you need to make a change to walk the way God would have you to walk. Maybe there's some in the audience not drinking from the eternal water that Jesus is offering. You certainly have a chance to make things right tonight if you so desire. We'd love to be able to offer a prayer up on your behalf to God. We'd also love to see the opportunity for you to enter the water and grave of baptism to become a New Testament Christian. I don't know your needs tonight, but certainly we have the opportunity tonight to do something that will transform your life into eternity. If you need to respond, please do so as we stand and as we sing.